The truth is formed in us by God so that we might know his truth and not our own. So you can take everything that you know to be true and completely pervert it. That's the, that's the correct word to use. To pervert the truth to lies. Now, I'm not saying that there's any news that's newsworthy. But if you watch the news, you will find people lying boldly in front of you when everything is even on videotape and they'll still lie. Because they think you're going to believe the lie. And many people do. Because they just don't think. They're ignoramuses. They don't they ignore the truth rather than follow it. The first reading talks about that God promises us that we're not going to be destroyed by a great flood again. Now every culture, virtually every culture that's known, has a history of the great flood. Now, why is that consistent if it wasn't true? Now, how that all came to be, what, what it was, and how it you know, came on and then receded, we don't know because we weren't there. All we can do is look at the factual evidence that's in the geology and in the written documentation. It's, it's far more than just a common uh, thread that human beings invent. It's, it's just too consistent. But what was the promise? Is that God was going to put a bow in the sky, a rainbow, that would be his sign and symbol of God's promise to us that he would show us mercy rather than destroy us by water again. And so it's perverted by perverted people so that they take on the symbol of God's promise, of God's covenant with his people so that we might do that which is an abomination before God? Homosexual behavior is absolutely condemned in the Old Testament and New Testament. It's condemned in every culture. Don't start with creating new histories that don't exist. In fact, current cultures reflect what ancient cultures did. If you're in a Muslim country, you don't say that you're homosexual. You will be killed. And I don't mean that there's going to be a court process that anyone goes through. You're just killed. There's no homosexuals in Muslim countries. If people have a same-sex attraction, they better not act upon it in any way, shape, or form because if they're found out, they will be killed. Now, I'm not saying that's a proper reaction. I'm not condoning that everybody who, who acts out upon homosexual tendencies is to be killed. I, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that what's wrong is wrong. And it's always wrong in every culture, in every place, or it wouldn't be the truth. You can't dress as a as another sex, says it in the Old Testament. In the same way it talks about homosexual behavior, a man shall not dress as a woman and a woman shall not dress as a man. It's an abomination before God. So it's not to be tolerated. Men who have problems, sexually deviant problems, are not people who have to be tolerated and certainly not allowed in women's locker rooms nor competing with them in sports. They need 
counseling. We don't tolerate sinful and bad behavior. It's not to be tolerated because God doesn't tolerate it. It's not being unfair. It's not being unjust. Oh, I'm sure there's plenty of woeful sinners who will stand up and go, it's unjust that God would say that I have to obey the Ten Commandments. I want to just do what I want to do, and I want to do with my own body. With what? Look, it's not like that. It doesn't matter how deviant the culture becomes. It doesn't matter how degraded it becomes. That doesn't mean that we should enter into that, tolerate it, or approve of it. Men and women are different. God created them male and female. And that's awful good. In fact, it's stunningly good. And he could have us be as asexual as a flower. And yet there's male parts to a flower and female parts. We, we could be like that. And we could have some form of bees that are the intermediary so that men can provide their portion of the genetic and, and then women get pregnant. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I often talk about the relationship between men and women as the dance of the porcupines. I won't stick you if you won't stick me. And we're going to go through this dance. And when it can be a lot better than that. But what if there was bees involved? We might get stung. Well, geez, you know, perhaps we're not far from that. But my brothers and sisters, if he says don't lie, that means don't lie. You don't tolerate it out of a president, a pope, or anybody. A lie is a lie. And it's going to lead you to hell. Lying cannot be tolerated. Adulterous behavior cannot be tolerated. It destroys the very fabric of our culture, of marriage between a man and a woman, celebrated so that they will make a pledge of a lifetime together, not knowing how difficult it may be or what all the joys are. But little kids take a long time to grow up. Used to be 18. Now it's like 26 or 30. My brothers and sisters, this kind of... Molly coddling should not be tolerated. If you refuse to worship God, then you shouldn't prevent anybody else from doing it. And I'm not talking about worshiping Satan or any other prevarication. I know. Father Rick, don't use five syllable words we don't understand. Look it up. We need to follow the Ten Commandments in what we do. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. Don't covet your neighbor's goods or their wife. Don't commit adultery or any other sexual sin. Sex is far too great and wonderful a thing to turn into something dirty and disgusting that just tears people down. We need to watch our language, to not use God's name in vain, to not use Jesus and his last name, Christ. But that also means you don't flippantly go around all the time going, oh my God. What are you trying to say? That's what people say when the airliner's going down. It comes from the pilots in the cockpit.
because they realize they're not ready to die. And neither are you. None of us is ready to die. We want to be as ready as we can be, but none of us is ready to die. Certainly not in our sin, whether we recognize we're sinful or not. You don't want to find yourself standing before the judgment seat a nanosecond after your death and find out you were wrong all along. Now, brothers and sisters, it's not that hard to know what the truth is, but to live it and to choose it every day. Now, that's a different matter. Truth is a difficult thing. Because truth exposes us before everybody else. If, if we understand that the truth about our life is not pretty, it's not perfect. But it is hopeful. There's hope for all of us, always. In fact, as I counsel a man this week who's making the right choices after a lifetime and not, He's out of prison now. He's sober now. He's got a good job. He's working hard. And the thing is, is if you do that, good things will happen to you. But if you sow evil things, you will reap evil things. And evil is not a separate principle. It's just the lack of good. And God is all good. So whatever we lack in the pureness of God, then we need to have God to make up for it. And so indeed he does. The whole purpose of God becoming one of us was that we might understand God's mercy. The distances that he'll go that we might have life and have it in its fullness, in its abundance. This life, because of sin, is not without its sufferings, but it isn't a suffering all the time. Spring will come. The rains will come and wash the earth and replenish it. The plants will breathe in our carbon dioxide and it will make oxygen and food for the critters that we eat. It's a wonderful plan. God takes the salt water, he evaporates it, brings it over the rest of the land and dumps fresh water on us. Day after day, year after year. Take your climate change and stick it where the sun don't shine. And that's a joke and it's the truth. Look at the beauty that this is. We can be good stewards of this land and we can be at the very pinnacle of it all. God made it for us. We are not the problem. Nor are we the solution, for only God makes it rain. Every farmer knows that. So what's going to wash you clean this year? Talks about it, our baptism. It's not just merely washing dirt off the outside. It's about washing our soul, making us clean again, making us presentable to God and a pleasure to other human beings. Your dog might even like you. My brothers and sisters, God is more faithful to us than any dog. Shows us more love than a dog ever will and is more perfect than even any human love. But he wants us to have human love. 
and he wants us to have happiness in our life which comes to us in the simplest of ways. The joy of seeing the dawn come again and dispel the darkness. It's the beauty of the day, whether it's snowing or sunny, whether it's warm or cold. It's for us to see it because it's already there. And you are part of this. You are an important part because you can't be replaced. You're singularly and utterly important because there's never been anybody like you and never will be again. Take up your place in this world. Be the best person you can be. Be the best man and the best woman you can be. And enjoy this life with the hope and real trust in God who has loved us first. That is the Lenten journey. Be blessed in it, my brothers and sisters. Be blessed in it.